1 John chapter 5 and 1 Timothy chapter 3. Now we're going to keep working through the doctrines of the church. And I, as I said before, felt very compelled by the Lord that that was a necessary thing for us to do and a good thing for us to do. <clears throat> so we're going to keep going through that. Now I don't know, at some point he may say that's enough, stop, and that's happened. But uh, for now we're just going to keep working through it, the essential doctrines of the church anyway. 1 John chapter 5 and verse number 7, we saw this in our last study regarding the doctrine of God, although we're going to start now the doctrine of Jesus Christ tonight. And uh, I'll say it again, as always, you can get the notes, but if you were hoping to have Bible Institute, uh, and you know that several of you are kind of looking for that, uh, I'd be taking notes if I were you, okay? Don't just wait for the notes to come to you, take some notes. Sometimes I give you something on the side that's not in the notes. 1 John chapter 5 and verse number 7, we, we talked about this in the doctrine of God. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And so we know that the Word of God, according to John chapter number 1, is the Lord Jesus Christ. When it's mentioned in that capacity there, the Word is Jesus Christ. And so they are one in the same, and yet three separate personalities in the Trinity. And uh, Jesus Christ occupies then what we call the second place in the Trinity. Now I want you to go over to 1 Timothy chapter number 3. And here's the importance of Jesus Christ as he relates to us in our study and in our, our dispensation and in our understanding of the scriptures. Is that he becomes God manifest in the flesh. Now Jesus Christ is... He didn't come into existence at the birth, uh, at his birth with Mary. Uh, when, when the Bible talks about she conceived the thing in her womb, it talks about that thing. It's referring to the body, but he predated that. And of course, he shows up in the Old Testament, and we know that from what the Bible says about him, that he was there in eternity past. Uh, John chapter number 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. Right? The same was in the beginning with God. And so he was already there, but he manifests himself, he manifests God. I want you to look at first John or first Timothy, sorry, chapter three, verse number sixteen, and without controversy, and that means that there should be no debate over this truth. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Remember what a mystery is. A mystery is something that you can't fully understand or explain necessarily, but you can believe it. And the only way for you to be able to explain it is for God to reveal it to you. And that's what a mystery is. It's something that's veiled in the mind until God manifests it or makes it revealed to you to help you understand it. Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Now that's not, that's not tough. And for those who believe that there are three separate gods or that uh, Jesus Christ wasn't God, you would have to go to great lengths to explain that verse away. But if you just accept the Bible as it stands, and we do, then we understand that God manifested himself in the flesh. And of course we know that then to be the person of Jesus Christ. Let's read the rest of the verse. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the Spirit. The Spirit of God then declared him to be a judicially True and right, that's what justified means. It's a declaration in judicial terms. Justified in the Spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. That can only be one person. That can only be Jesus Christ. Okay? Um, now, I might get a little ahead of myself, but this verse keeps popping into my mind as we're sitting here right now. I want to go to Colossians chapter number 2. And this is what I mean about taking notes because sometimes God will just give something on the spot. And that's, this is one of them. But this verse keeps coming to mind while I'm sitting here talking. So I want to give it to us now. There's a reason for it. Colossians chapter 2 and verse number 9. Uh, <clears throat> actually, we'll go to verse 8 because that will help us to know who we're talking about. He says in verse 8, Colossians 2 verse 8, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men after the rudiments of the world, and rudiments, if you don't know, means the basic principles 
of the world and not after Christ. So Christ becomes the person, the subject matter. Verse number 9, For in Him, that's in Christ, dwelleth all of the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Everything that there is about God, the fullness of Him, was found in the person of Jesus Christ. That is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And so this is the person then that uh, we're going to study, the person of Jesus Christ. Let me make a few statements. Uh, along with the doctrine of the Bible, as far as I can see and my understanding, my experience, it seems to me that the doctrine of Jesus Christ is one of the most attacked doctrines uh, in the Christian faith and in the Bible. So, so the Bible is attacked, and then the doctrine of Jesus Christ is attacked, and tried to, they try to malign it. Now, it shouldn't surprise us when you think about why. If you attack the doctrine of the Bible, then you undermine our authority. It's our information source. We can't learn anything about God without the Bible. And so if you undermine the Bible and you take that away from us, then you've taken away our source of truth and our understanding of God. But then moving on, when you start talking about the doctrine of Jesus Christ, uh, of course that would be attacked because there's no other way of salvation than through Christ. And so if you can destroy the doctrine of Christ, for instance, if you can say, if you can bring in this, this damnable heresy that he's not God, then you, you remove his ability to take away sins completely. And it, I don't know if you understand this or not, but if, if someone believes that Jesus Christ isn't God, they have to then come to the conclusion that there's works in addition to the sacrifice of Jesus, even if they believe he died for sins, there's works that have to be added to it, and the reason works have to be added to it is because he's just a man as well. He can't be sufficient to pay for sins. You have to then add something to it. So there's a, there's a series of logical, uh, you know, because of this, then this, because of this, then this. You'll have to add works to your salvation. But if you accept Jesus Christ as God in the flesh, that God was his father, then he has a sinless nature about him, and because he has a sinless nature about him, he's able to pay the sacrifice for sins, and that means that it's all by grace and not by works, which is what Romans 4 tells us, right? That if it's by grace, then it can't be by works, and if it's by works, then it can't be by grace. It's got to be one or the other, Amen. all right? So it's by grace, and it's by the grace of God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So, why attack the doctrine of Christ? Because by doing that, they can attack not only him as a person, but our only way of salvation. A man by the name of Sinclair Patterson said this, The whole substance and strength of the Christian faith centers in Jesus Christ. Without him, there is absolutely nothing. That's a true statement. William Evans, he's, uh, these guys have written systematic theology books, and William Evans says this, from beginning to end, in all its various phases and aspects and elements, the Christian faith and life is determined by the person and work of Jesus Christ. Um, <clears throat> I was just communicating with someone recently, and I said, you know, we, we were just being open with one another, and I'll, I'll prop the door open a little bit to help you see into this, have an illustration. There were some things that I was saying, there, there are things about me that I don't like. And I would really like to see them change. And they, I find them very difficult to change. And they were offering some things up and, and some advice. And, and I said, you know, ultimately, though, we all have to just come to this understanding that if there's things about us that we don't like and we don't think they're right, the only way to make that right is through the power of the Spirit of God making us like Jesus Christ. That's the only way to fix it, is we have to become more like Jesus. And, and so... That is what the Christian life is about. Uh, we know we talk about being a good witness, but if we're a good witness, that's being like Christ because he was a faithful witness. That's what the Bible says in Revelation about him. If I want to become more gentle in how I deal with people, then I'm going to have to be more like Jesus because he was a good shepherd and kind and tender, full of pity, the Bible says. If I want to be able to have control over my anger and wrath, I need to be more like Jesus, who himself never lost his temper, but he had righteous indignation when it was necessary. You understand? So our Christian life is wrapped up in the person of Jesus. If we want to be better than what we are, 
It's not about God help me to do better. It's about God help me to be more like your son. So our Christian life is wrapped up in the person of Jesus Christ. The central element of the Christian faith is found in the Lord Jesus Christ. The religion, and I use that word in its very strictest, purest form, not religion as amongst this religion amongst others, but the purest of religion of Christianity cannot exist if Jesus in his deity and his humanity are removed from our teaching. The perfect mix of God and man. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to give you my own personal doctrinal statement. We're going to talk about the doctrinal statement of the church too. But here is, here is something that I would like to see many of you develop on your own, your own statement, your own belief about him that's consistent with the Bible. But how about this? I believe in Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man at the same time. This truth is represented in the biblical names of the Son of God and the Son of Man. Jesus is the manifestation of God in human form, that is, manifested in the flesh. He's perfect in every way. He is the only way of salvation. He was born of a virgin. He lived a sinless life, died on a cross at Calvary, was buried, arose bodily from the dead, ascended to heaven, sits at the right hand of God the Father's throne, making intercession for believers. We'll meet His bride in the air at the rapture, and will return bodily to the earth to establish His millennial kingdom on earth. Jesus Christ is not a God amongst gods. He is God the Son. Do you agree with most of that? All of that, I hope? Let's look at the identity of Jesus Christ. Uh, what does this name Christ, this title Christ, mean? By definition, it means the anointed one. I took at Webster's 1828 uh, definition. I, I still encourage you to use Oxford. I, I still think that's best, but I took the 1828 on this occasion. And he says this, It was a custom of antiquity to consecrate persons to the sacerdotal and regal offices by anointing them with oil. And so that was the whole idea behind being an, the anointed one. So Christ is the anointed one, but he's anointed by God for the purpose. The title was given to many people in Israel even before the Lord Jesus Christ. But the difference is, is that they were, for example, they were saviors or judges amongst judges. But he's, he's not amongst them. He, he is the ultimate of all of that, okay? And so he's not referred to as a Christ in the Bible, ever. He's referred to as the Christ, and so what we find is that God uses that specific language, that definitive article of the. And he, he uses that to describe Jesus as the Christ, the Messiah. Because he's making it that he, he didn't just come out and he's, that he's a standout amongst men, but that he is the culmination. He is the full fruition of what God had in mind as the Savior of the world, as the anointed one. And while they might have been anointed by men, Saul was anointed by men, David was anointed by men, Samuel was anointed by men. But you take Jesus Christ, he's anointed by God to be the Son of God, to be the, the Christ, the Savior of the world. Now let's look at some more scriptures tonight, Matthew chapter number 16. And we're going to look at some testimony of the identity of Christ. So we're talking now, if you're taking notes, we're talking about his identity and in that identity, is it just something that we, people all the time say, well, what does the Baptist church believe? My first response to that always is it's not a matter of what the Baptist church believes. It's about what the Bible teaches. I don't care what a Baptist church believes. I care about what the Bible says. Because if a Baptist church is saying it wrong, it's different from the Bible, they're wrong. So it's not a, this isn't a denominational thing. It's not, well, we believe this because we're Baptists. We believe this because... We believe the Bible. Amen. And you know, I know this puts people, it puts some of you off. And I'm sorry, you just have to live with it. But I'm more Bible than I am Baptist. Okay? All right? And I hope that you will be too. Because I don't want us falling underneath a denominational banner and calling ourselves by a name and hoping that that covers a multitude of sins. No way. I, I believe the Bible. And if you strip the name Baptist from me, I wouldn't change one bit from what I am right now. Okay? We believe the Bible. So, Matthew chapter number 16, verse number 13. We want the testimony. 
this isn't, that's why I got off track there. You got to stop diverting me like that. This isn't the testimony of our church that says, all right, well, you know, this is the creed that we hold to. So our creed says this. This is what the Bible says. What did God tell us about Jesus that helps us to hold the position that he's the Christ? So there were testimonies given throughout the Bible that help us to establish that position. Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. Most of these you're familiar with. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, Whom do men say that I the Son of Man am? Now isn't that what I'm talking about right there? That there are some who just make a statement, but they don't necessarily know what the Bible has to say about it. We don't want to be that. Because he's asking this question, he's setting it up for them to have to make their own clear statement, but based on truth, all right? So who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Verse 14, and they said, some say that thou art John the Baptist. Well, by this time, John the Baptist has had a haircut right here, and he lost his head, okay? He's, He's dead, but they believed, some were believing that he rose from the dead and came back and that, that Jesus was the manifestation of John the Baptist. All right, some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias. and So that's Elijah from the Old Testament. Some were saying, well, Elijah's come back and that's who this is. And others, Jeremiah, so Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, he, he's essentially saying this, fair enough. But whom say ye that I am? Okay? You group of men that I'm discipling, who do you say I am? And Simon Peter in verse 16 answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, guys, he didn't just snatch that out of thin air. And we know that because of what Jesus says to him. He didn't just on the spot form an opinion. God gave him truth that he communicated out of his mouth. Verse number 17. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. So Jesus Christ. Now there's a lot of ramifications here. I want you to follow with me. He, in, this, in this passage, God taught Peter to say what he said. And in saying that, he said, you are the Christ. Definite article. The Christ. The Son of the living God. And we're going to have to cross-reference something here in just a moment. But I want you to see that Peter, at that moment, is speaking the mind of God on this. Remember, that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. So when this was recorded... It was recorded so that we would understand that the Holy Spirit and God the Father, through the mouth of Peter, were making a declaration concerning Jesus Christ. All right? Peter at that moment was speaking on behalf of the Father, and when it was written down, that was the Holy Spirit saying, because me and the Father are in agreement, I want you to know perfectly that that's the truth about Christ. You understand? That's how that's recorded. All right? So he gives us this definitive statement that he is the Christ. He's speaking the mind of God. Now here's what I want you to understand. That when Jesus heard that, if he wasn't who he said he was and who he was claiming to be and who who these men were saying he was, then he needed to say, whoa, Peter, you've taken that too far. That's not true. Don't say that about me. That's not true. If he's an honest individual. But the fact that he received the title, accepted it to himself, accepted that what was said was true, and then said, you're blessed because the Father told you to say that about me, he was indicating, yes, that's exactly who I am. That's my title. I'm the Christ. Okay? So, I want you to cross-reference this with, uh, with Luke chapter number 9. Luke chapter number 9. In Luke chapter number 9, we'll read verses 18 to 21. Uh, now, I've, I've, I've made the statement a couple of times that it's God who anointed Christ for this position. Let's see it. 
Luke chapter 9, verses 18 to 21. All right, verse 18. And it came to pass as he was alone praying, his disciples were with him, and he asked them, saying, Whom say the people that I am? Now notice that this is a parallel passage, different perspective, different writer, different perspective. They answering said, John the Baptist, but some say Elias. The others say that uh, one of the old prophets is risen again. He said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? Peter answering said, Watch the phrase, the Christ of God. Verse 21, and he straightly charged them and commanded them to tell no man that thing. The Christ, what does Christ mean? The anointed. The anointed of who? Of God. God is the one that anointed Jesus Christ to be the Christ. Okay? So again, notice, I hope that you see something that I'm not just, I'm not just making statements to try to garner you know, support and amen and, and all that. I'm, I'm trying to give to you why we believe what we believe. And to understand when you're reading your Bible, those words, those little phrases like of God, that makes a big difference in our understanding. It, it establishes the truth of what we're claiming to believe. He is the Christ of God. He is the anointed one that God is the one who anointed him. All right? Now, Let's look at the testimony of John in John chapter number 20. There's a principle in the Bible that most of you are familiar with that says that it's in the mouth of two or three witnesses that a thing is established. Which means that we need to hear something spoken or written on more than one occasion to establish it as a doctrine. Now, that doesn't mean if something's spoken once, you can't believe it. You can. But if you're going to establish it as a doctrine, you need to have at least two witnesses to that. Now, we got more than two witnesses to who Jesus is, but this is the purpose behind establishing his identity. All right? Uh, so we look at John chapter number 20, verses 30 and 31. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is, notice the next two words again, the Christ, not a Christ, the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. So there's a twofold purpose that John wrote his gospel. One is that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and notice that definite article, and that believing that truth about Jesus, that we might have life through his name as well. Now, Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, most of you know that. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given amongst men whereby we must be saved. Another important word, not can be saved. Not can be saved, because that might mean that you can be saved another way too. The only way that you must be saved is through the name of Jesus Christ. So John's writing this to establish Jesus is the Christ, and when that's established, that you then would understand it and put your faith in who that person is, and you'd be saved. Okay, I'm going to move on. Go to John chapter 4. John chapter number 4. We'll look at a, a third testimony. The woman at the well. John chapter 4. Now you guys remember, there's. Uh, let's do it this way. Uh, I'm going to change my notes just a bit here. Let's look at John chapter 4 verse 9. So you remember he came to the woman, or he came to the well there in Sychar, according to verse number 4. It's Jacob's well. Uh, he sits down there to, to rest. The disciples take off to go get something to eat. He's there on his own. This woman from Samaria comes out. Verse number 9, she, he's asked her to give him some water. She says in 9, Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. All right, so she's resisting immediately. 
Then verse number 12. Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? So she's challenging him. You don't have any dealings with the Jews or, or with Samaritans as a Jew. Why are you doing that? And then she moves to, well, who do you think you are? Are you better than Jacob that gave us the well? And then I want you to skip down to verse number 19. She's just kind of progressing in her, in her arguments. Verse 19, the woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. So now she moves into the religious aspect and says, Okay, well, you've told me some things that are pretty private, so you must be a prophet. God must have told you those things about me. Do you see how she's progressing from Jew to who do you think you are better than Jacob? And then, okay, now you're a prophet. And then you look at verse number 29. Verse 29 and by this time, she is so fully convinced on who he is that she says this, Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? The Christ. And so I want you to look then in verses 28 and 29 together. The woman left her water pot. She left the purpose that she went there for. And she went her way into the city because when people truly... Hear what I'm about to say. When people are truly converted to Jesus Christ, their thoughts immediately turn to those around them who need to know. There's no way that we can look in the heart of somebody that claims to get saved and maybe doesn't become evangelistic and know whether they're saved. They might be, and I'm not making this statement to call any of that into question. But it's totally foreign to the Bible for somebody to come to know Christ as Savior and then just sit on it and say nothing. They actively get involved in telling other people about it. It's a totally foreign concept for somebody to say, I know Christ is my Savior, and then be absolutely devoid of evangelism at all. They don't open their mouth. They don't go... Can I just put it in our modern terms? They don't go to street ministry. They don't go to door knocking. They don't witness when they're, when they're going to the shops. They're, they're not talking to their neighbors. They're not doing any of it. That doesn't even exist in the Bible. So, you know, and if that, if that is you, if that describes you, that, well, I'm just a sign. I just believe we ought to live it. I believe you ought to live it too, but that's a cop-out because that's not what he told us to do. He told us to preach the gospel to every creature, not live the gospel to every creature. So that's the first thing. But if you find yourself in that capacity, you at least need to step back and say, what do I have? I, maybe I have a different conversion from what the people in the Bible had. <laughs> I might have had a conversion to a, a, a set of truths without actually coming to Christ. Do you understand the difference? You can put your faith in, a, in some factual information, and that's not salvation. But you can put your faith in the person of Jesus Christ, and that's salvation. And if you boys don't stop mucking around, I'm going to call you by name. Now, she says, come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Definitive. Now, once again, if Jesus isn't who he said he was, if he's, if he's not an absolute imposter, then he, sh if, sorry, if he's not who he says he was, if he's an imposter, the only honest thing to do there would be to say, wait, guys, no, this whole city comes out, they're trying to find out uh, who this man is. No, 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 I never said that. I, that's not, that she's got it all wrong. You know, I'm a, yes, I'm a good man. And uh, yes, I'm, I'm trying to do the best I can for God, but I'm not the Son of God. I'm not Christ. But he doesn't. He receives it, accepts it, and then uses it to win them to himself. All right, look out at verse number 39. And many of the Samaritans of the city believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified, he told me all that ever I did. So when the Samaritans were coming to him, they besought him, that he would tarry with them, and he abode there two days. And many more believed because of his own word, and said unto the woman, Now we believe not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. 
Do you see what he did? He used her testimony. They come to him. He verifies the truth of it. I'm in the Christ. They believe. And then their testimony is, he's the Christ. Do you see that? All right. That's the testimony of the woman and those at Jacob's well. John chapter 11. We'll just hit these testimonies tonight and we'll leave it at that. John chapter number 11, verse number 20. John eleven twenty. 20. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary sat still in the house. Now skip to verse 25. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. All right, this is her testimony again, directly connected. And notice this connection in this verse. You're the Christ, the Son of God. Do you see that? In verse number 27, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God. And so this thing about being Christ is connected directly to his position as God's Son, or the Son of God. And again, he receives it, and he accepts it. He didn't stop her and correct her. Uh, let's see. We find the same truth in John chapter 1 with, uh, with Andrew going and telling Simon Peter. Let, let's go ahead and look at that because it brings in two things here. John chapter number 1. John chapter 1. John 1 and verse number 35. Again the next day after, John stood and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and saw them following, saith unto them, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to, to say, being interpreted master, Where dwellest thou? He saith unto them, Come and see. I think I need to skip down. Yep, okay, we're, we're good. They came and saw where he dwelt and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon and saith unto him, We have found the, now watch, Messiah. That's Old Testament word, Messiah. We found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. So any Jew at that point, any Jew reading this or th that hears this or that's testified of this, they understand the connection that's being made. The, the Hebrew name title is Messiah or Messiah as it's recorded in the New Testament. But the Greek name of saying it is Christ. Do you understand? And so God gives it to us in one. He says, I don't want you to have any confusion about who we're talking about here. Right from the get-go, I want you to understand that the Messiah, the Christ, is the person, Jesus. And so, verse 42, And he brought him to Jesus, and when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah, thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. So once again, it's just established over these testimonies over and over and over and over again. Um, then, then, John chapter number 10. You remember that Jesus said, he, he would make claims about who he was, and the Pharisees and religious people would say, well, you can't say that about yourself. Anybody can claim that about themselves. And he said something to this effect. He said, it's true, anybody can say those things about themselves, but nobody can demonstrate it. And he said, that's your problem, is you're not watching the fact that I'm demonstrating who I am. I've told you that I'm the Son of God. I've told you that I'm the Christ. I've demonstrated it by what I've said. If you don't want to receive what I've said, then at least believe me for the work's sake. Do you understand? So he's saying, just... If it was just any random man saying it, you would have right to reject it. But you found nothing wrong with what I've said. 
and you've watched my works, and my works verify that my words are true. So believe me for the works' sake if you're not going to believe me for what I said. But if you believe my works, then believe what I said. You understand? That's his logic there. So for Jesus Christ to claim to be the Christ is completely valid because they never could find anything wrong in anything that he said. And so his testimony then stands true. If I said, let's illustrate. If I go out on the street and I say, uh, I'm the pastor uh, of the Bible Baptist Church in Queen Bean, and somebody were to say, I don't believe that, I would say, well, okay, why don't you come along and you can talk to those that are at the church and uh, on Sunday you come and just see how I'm addressed and, and how I conduct myself and if that's not in the capacity of being a pastor, then you're fine, you can reject that. But if it clearly demonstrates that I'm pastoring that church, then you, you have to receive what I'm saying. That's what he's getting at. You can see it, so believe it. So it's not that just saying it yourself is invalid. It's that you've got to demonstrate it. So here he goes, John chapter 10, verse number 23. I don't know if I over-explain that to you, saying, yeah, 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 we get it, or if that helped turn the light on. But John chapter 10, verse 23. Jesus walked into the temple, in the temple, in Solomon's porch. Then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. <laughs> You're like, how many times do I have to say it? Jesus answered them, I told you, and you believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. All right, so he said, I am testifying to you that I'm the Christ. If you don't want to hear me say it, just look at what I'm doing. Nicodemus knew. Teacher, we know, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles except God be with him. Is that right, Nicodemus? You know, you need to be born again, man. Because you, you see these things that I'm doing, and you know they're from God, and yet still you resist the truth. What's going on with you? Right? Now, look at Luke chapter number 24, and we'll get ready to tidy this up. Luke chapter number 24. Jesus Christ claims, testifies, adds his voice to the fact that he's the Christ. Luke chapter number 24. He does it twice in this passage. Uh, Luke 24 verses 25 to 27. We'll set the scene again. He's on the road, the, the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And they're talking amongst themselves. They don't know who he is yet. He joins himself to them. Verse 25. Then he, they, they explain what they're going on about, what they're so sorrowful about. Then he said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things? I'm sure you see it, but let me state it just in case you're missing it. He's heard what they've talked about happened in Jerusalem with the crucifixion. And after hearing it, he says to them, How come you're so silly? You're so foolish. When you read the Old Testament, do you not understand that, the, that the, the prophet said that this would happen to Christ, Messiah? All right, keep reading. Um, Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Verse 27, and beginning at Moses, which is a reference to beginning in Genesis... And all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Now he just got done saying, did you not read in the Old Testament what was going to happen to Christ? And then he gives them the greatest Sunday school lesson of all history and says, all of these things are true about me. All right. Well, they walk a bit further. He has a meal with them and he blessed some food and they realize who he is and he vanishes. Well, they hoof it back to Jerusalem. And they find the other disciples. They burst in. And as they, they're bursting in, as Mary is saying, you are not going to believe who I saw. <laughs> and she's testifying about what, what she's experienced, what she's seen, the conversation she's had. And Simon Peter has just come back and said, I saw Jesus. He's, he's not in the grave. I know that. John's gone down there and said, what? 
I walked in there and that napkin was folded up nicely that was about his face and he's not there. And so they're all testifying. In come these two disciples in chapter 24 and verse number 44. You can imagine how overwhelming all of this was for all these people. In verse 44 he said, and he said unto them, uh, sorry, he, they're, they're in there. I need to set the scene a bit better. I'm sorry. So they're in there talking about all this, and they're telling what they saw, that he appeared to us on the road. He had some food. He prayed. He vanished out of our sight. It was Jesus. We know it was him. Uh, you know, he's alive. And while all this is going on, Jesus shows up in the room. And they're, they're beside themselves, and they get scared to death. They think he's a, a spirit, a manifesting spirit. And so in verse 44, he's telling them, you don't need to worry about that. A spirit, verse 39, he says, a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. Verse 44, he said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Don't we need that? And said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ. Once again, what he's done is he said, This is everything that was taught in the Old Testament about me. That's what he said. And he said, And that's Christ. It behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, except those who don't believe that, that repentance is a work. Don't let them preach it. But for those who don't believe that repentance is a work, preach repentance and remission of sins uh, in his name among all nations. It's clearly not just Jewish. It's not, this isn't a, some clown says, wasn't well, that a Jewish great commission? I suppose for you it is. Beginning at Jerusalem, and ye are witnesses of these things. I'm sorry to get distracted with that stuff. but And so what did he do? He said, I'm the Christ. And he did this, another Sunday school lesson to all those people in that room that day and explained what all of the scriptures had to say about Christ. And then he said, that's me. And he added his testimony to it and said, John was right, Martha was right, Peter was right, Andrew was right. The, they're all right. I'm the Christ. Now, why is that so important? Let's finish up 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter number 2. If somebody said, well, you know, we can ag agree to disagree on that. No, we can't. We cannot. 1 John chapter 2 and verse number 22. Why is it so important that we understand that Jesus is the Christ. 1 John 2, verse 22. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? Someone who says that Jesus wasn't the Christ is a liar. There's a whole religion out there that says he wasn't the Christ. There's a whole religion that says he was just another prophet. Who are you going to believe? Are you going to believe the testimony of God Almighty or of another religion? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Why is it so important? Someone who says that Jesus isn't the Christ is a liar and is Antichrist or against Jesus Christ and against the Father. Because you can't deny who Jesus is without having to then point your finger at God and say, no, he's not who you said he was. Because God is the one who anointed him to be the Christ. So to deny it is to say God was wrong. And so he says that's anti-Christ, it's anti-God. You're denying the Father and the Son both. And of course then chapter 5 verse 1 here is the true mark of a believer. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. The earmark of a true believer 
is believing that Jesus is the Christ. Okay? And uh, that means you have to love those that are in him. And there's your earmark of believers. We love him and we love those that are in him because they're part of his body. You can't hate your brother and love Christ. That's not how it works. You love Christ, you got to love your brother. I'm sorry for you guys to have to do that. I, I mean, I, I'm, you have to love me. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> All right. Father, thank you for this good introduction to the doctrine of your son. Thank you for him. And I pray that you'd help us to accept and receive the truth regarding him in your word. Dismiss us tonight with your blessing. Take us home safely. Uh, bring us back here again Sunday safely. And, and with the people, so many have to go back out in the world tomorrow morning and work amongst the rubbish and rot and and it's just so draining on their spirit. Would you lift their spirits, strengthen them for that, and maybe even bring back to memory some of the truths regarding your son that would just help to strengthen them, and bless them, and have some joy, and to be a good witness as they finish out this week. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We're dismissed.